Hello and welcome to our virtual rhinoplasty meetings. My name is Dr. Cameron McIntosh and I'm the president of SORSA or the Society of Rhinoplasty Surgeons of South Africa. So during the coronavirus lockdown period, we decided to have bi-weekly Zoom meetings. We specifically chose teachers from around the world to be able to cover many topics. Unfortunately, due to patient confidentiality, we can't actually show you the real talks. However, the very interesting interactive question and answer sessions is what we're going to be showing you. We want to give a shout out to our colleagues around the world fighting coronavirus. Please look after yourselves and be safe. So I'm not going to say anything more. Enjoy the show. Episode 9, we find ourselves in Bergamo in Italy, listening to Enrico Robotti speaking to us about rib reconstruction finesse rhinoplasty. Well, Prof, thank you so much for that. That is, um, that is fantastic. I see there are lots of questions that have come up. Um, I'm really excited to see what Bergamo is about because this is now the ninth uh, meeting we're having. And it's, it is, it is these no, seven, about seven. preservation, non-preservation. So it's a very exciting for, to come and visit you in February next year. Well, uh, I, I, I have to be frank because, the, you know, when the, there's no reason to just show only the best results and whatever. I love the preservation concept. I have yeah. studied them. I've gone to the dissection room. I visited Peter a number of times. Some of them I have adopted. On some, I have a lot of issues, and I want these items to be clear, to be clearly stated. I want the right questions asked and the right videos shown. People mm -hmm. need to understand. Otherwise, it's just a social media thing. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to jump into the questions. We're going to start from the, from the first question that we asked. Uh, from Ted Ra wants to know, can you explain bone suturing technique, please? Well, that's not my thing. I mean, that comes from my dear friend Wolfgang and from Sebastian Hack, who in perfectioned it. He has a very good paper. He has, they actually have a couple of papers. I think the very good one was on FPS, so you can find it. But essentially the concept is when you put a spreader, especially in a secondary case, or when you do bone work in an asymmetric fashion in a primary case or in a crooked nose, you will often have the circumstance in which you need to make sure that these bones are sutured together in a stable manner so that you don't have to depend on a splint. So in the primary situation, <clears throat> either a crooked or asymmetric nose, whatever you do to these bones, it's a good idea to stabilize them. To do that, you need holes. To make holes, you need either a drill or a piezo, and then you need a suture to transfix these holes and hold these bones together. In a secondary case with a rib, you need these rib spreaders which have been put in a slot, which has been done either by a Lindemann a burr or by a piezo. You need something to make a circlage and hold everything together. And Sebastian has designed a very good it's a brilliant idea. It's a little adapter which goes together with, a, with an average burr and it will adapt to a needle. So the needle, you have to be careful when you use it the first time, otherwise it will fly. You, you need to use it to run it once it's touching bone and not before, but it will perforate the bone and in the needle you will run your suture. And you can do it in different ways. That's a crisscross or a surclage suture. And that's essential. I think this is an essential thing. And it's the same concept in which I stabilize my SPLF construct. Although my suture at the radix does not have to be too tight. I made this mistake. I broke the lamina a couple of times. You have just to just stabilize. It. Awesome. That kind of ties up to a question from Philia. She wanted to know what is the average thickness for a standard spread of graphs that you harvest from rib? I have no idea. You know, it, 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 uh, well, uh, it depends on the case. It depends on the type of rib. Of course, when you have a calcification, you have to force this hair transplant blade or the same thing. You have, but sometimes I want an asymmetric spreader because I want more on one side because the septum may also be deviated or weak. It depends. The luxury of having a full thickness rib. And here I descend from many dear friends who take a wedge. 
If you take a wedge in a rib, why do you do that? You do that because you don't want an issue with your pleura and you want to make sure that you do things safely, which I agree on. But I prefer just to leave perichondrium on my deep portion and take the whole thickness. Because as you saw, even if it's synchondrotic, actually it's even better if it's, it has a little bit of a, of a bent shape because I can play with the oblique concept. But from that segment, whether it is straight or a little bit curved, I can take many segments. And then I have the luxury of choice. Now, with experience, I can tell you, I do about 100 ribs now per year, so I, I know when I cut it that that segment will be more apt for a spreader or less apt for a spreader. And so I will mark it with a little methylene blue marking, right? Excellent, excellent. Okay. Maybe um, two, three millimeters. A question from uh, De Vittold. He would like to know, how do you adequately close donor site if you harvest both rib perichondrium and rectus fascia? All right, that's a long story again. Uh, when I was doing reconstructive surgery, I used to do my pect bilateral flaps. I also published this at some point uh, for mediastinitis. And uh, it was demonstrated, that's another long story, that you don't really every time have to put something in the space where the segment of sternum or a rib used to be. That will just fill by itself. So my concept is when I am harvesting, I am changing my direction so as to follow the muscle fibers, so I'm not transacting anything. And then my assistant, Francesco, at the end of the case, he's, I'm doing on a separate table my rib shaping, and he's suturing on separate planes. What is he suturing? So there's nothing left since I've taken perichondrium anteriorly, and there's perichondrium on the back. That doesn't matter. That space does not need anything. If there is a little bit of remaining rib segments, because we have to morselize them to avoid having sharp edges, we can place them, but on them, the muscle will just sit directly on them over the muscle the superficial fascia will be closed and on top of that the dermis that's not an issue that's absolutely not an issue i have not had one single case in which there has been a show of rib edges i have had two cases in bodybuilders in which probably not enough attention was placed in repairing the superficial fascia, so there was a little dimple. And I have had only one case in which I've had a seroma. And uh, what you have to do, this is a little bit delicate, don't over dissect. When you dissect looking for your rectus fascia, you will only need three by three centimeters usually. So you don't have to dissect a huge amount. If you over dissect, you just need a couple of uh, kilting sutures so as to make sure that that is strongly adapted, as well as now, since we've had this single seroma, we are using a compression dressing for at least 24 hours before we take the catheter out the following morning. Okay, thank you for that. So uh, Faisal says, great talk, Enrico. Thank you very much. On dorsum augmentation, the lamina you put in the perichondrium pocket is rectangular. However, the original shape of the dorsum is like a canoe. So I shape my laminated onlay grafts like a canoe, not rectangular. Why do you prefer the rectangular shape? Greetings, uh, Fazel. I, that's, a, that's a very good question. You know, I, in, in another part of my talk, which I didn't show to you because this is recent, I am in males in males, Fazio, shaping my trap, little bit of a trapezoid shape, which is not, it's, it's almost a canoe, but it's a little bit more, a little bit wider cranially than caudally. So it's a little bit like this. Now, in a woman, this uh, trapezoid issue, which I know people like Baris talk about, I don't really agree on that. I think the dorsal lines women like uh, the ones that we see on the Dallas textbook. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's a joke. I mean, are they are more like the, I don't really think that women like a white dorsal. So I am doing this. I am shaping it and I am doing it on males. 
However, and, and frankly, you know, sometimes these little nuances, I'm not sure you can actually see them because the concept is you have to suture the edges, which is where the two soft things meet because the lamina is inside. You have to suture the, the actual edge to the remainders of the upper lath. So I'm not so sure you would visibly see the shape. Now, on a man, now I'm more careful of this one. Awesome. I see Re Xavier has a question finally. Nice to hear from Portugal. Great talk. Thank you so much. Do you fix the cephalic part of your dorsal sandwich and how? Thanks. Well, that's a good point. So my concept is fix everything. Where did I pick this from my, I call that tailored DCF or customized DCF because I did it 0.8, 0.9 by three centimeters. And I fixated to the septal angle, to my upper lats, and with two sutures at the radius. Now, I'm doing a similar thing, but fixation to the septal angle is okay. Fixation to the upper lats is okay. It it's done with 6 OPDS, so it's kind of painstaking. It's very slow. But regarding the bony area, I will go, as I said, trans osseous. I will make a circlage, and I will stabilize that construct. On top of that, I will have two sutures which are guided through at the radix. So I am stabilizing it at the radix by a trans osseous circlage suture. Now, why is this better than a DCF? Because in my experience, DCF at the radix is a little bit problematic. People say, okay, you can shape it with your fingers, you can shape it with your uh, splint. In reality, that's not that so. And I've had more than one instance in which I had a little shift to one side or a surface irregularity. Oh, you have a, a question from our Secretary General, one of your previous fellows. And Ken Sani wants to know, a good evening, Dr. Robot. Well, excellent you. talk. Can I suture the SPLF sandwich to the circs perichondrial slash periosteal flaps to have a smooth transition that's laterally? A, that's a brilliant question. But that would be, in a, I did this only once, in a patient who was a primary and who wanted primary augmentation. That's a, probably a very good idea. If somebody is not as a revision case, just wants a, so they, you can, okay, let's, let's say it this way. In most revision cases, you cannot have the perichondrial periosteal flaps because they are not present because somebody has messed up with your dorsum, right? Now, in cases where your dorsum is still with these flaps available, which usually is a primary case, then I can raise my flaps, put the construct, and suture the edge of these were described by Nazim, perichondrial periosteal flaps, to the edge of my construct. Of course you can do that. And I can tell you something else also. If you want, you could also put a tiny bit, I've done that, of DC with the trocar, you need a trocar for that, within this interspace between the fascia and the lamina if you need a little bit more height or you can double stack your lamina that's another option okay awesome uh, there's a question from ibrahim he wants to know can you use perichondrium of the septum in your spf perichondrium of what of the septum uh well you know, theoretically, it could be, but in these cases, the septum is a miserable animal and it's been messed around, it's weak, it's mostly insufficient. And uh, I, we are talking of secondary issues. Sometimes there's even fistulas. Yeah. I don't think I would find, even in a primary case, enough septum perichondrium to have this kind of uh, use. Plus, it's a, it's, it's, it's a good question, but if you think of septum perichondrium, try taking a rib and try working on a piece of septum. I mean, it's a different thing. Yeah. It's a very flimsy item, the one that comes from the septum. Okay, uh, another question here from S. I'm not sure who that is. Great talk, Enrico! Exclamation. One question. How do you shape the dome's point when reconstructing the tip with rib graft? Only with those sutures visible on the pictures? 
or with other techniques? Well, once again, the problem with your domes in second, with your uh, lateral crura in secondary is that you may or may not have enough left. If you have enough left, I'm talking of the usual quite frequent circumstance in which they have done a Goldman-like procedure. If you have enough uh, segment of lateral cruise close to your dome, I will extend that segment by a rib lamina, meaning that I still have the luxury of, of having a dome, which is the original dome, which I may change to some degree, and then I just extend the lateral crura. In those circumstances in which the destruction is complete, either I reconstruct everything by rib, which I can essentially do only if the rib is pliable enough, or I forget about all this stuff, I will have a central pillar, and then I will have an articulated like construct. Awesome. Okay, here's a great question from Stuart in Cape Town. In secondary rhinoplasties, you mentioned thinning of the tip. Can you give us some idea of when you would do this and contrast this with repair of Patangi's ligament or supra tip sutures? All right, Pitanga's ligament is becoming like, it's unbelievable. Uh, Pitanga's ligament is probably, I'm sorry to have to say this, it's, it's, I know it's beautiful anatomically, but I'm not so sure if, if it's uh, the mainstay of rhinoplasty. Uh, <laughs> I have been able to admire Pitanga's ligament in the last two years because everybody is talking about it, and I have finally come to like it and mark it in all my cases. Now, what do I do with it? In my primary cases, I mark it and I use it in exactly the same way as Bauman Guyuron was doing 20 years ago with a little bit of subdermal tissue to, to redo his uh, little supratip break. Now, doing it with Pitangi's ligament is better because you have a rope so you can mobilize it and you can have less risk of a little dimple. But in many cases, the Pitangi ligament cannot really be repositioned as people love talking about because your tip has changed. It's longer, it's shorter, it's different, and it won't sit in the same place. You know, I don't have the 17 year old, 18 year old population with beautiful tips and a little bit of humps. So maybe my, I'm a little, I have my patients are a little bit different from other patient populations. So having said this, Pitangi ligament in primary rhinoplasty, I recognize, I use as a, I reconstruct it as a supra tip definer. Same concept as Bauman, a little bit more refined because you can play with it, you can move it around. Mm -hmm. Now in a secondary case, you don't have it because they've messed around with it, unless in certain, you know, the cases I told you about, let's discriminate, are cases which are complicated. So otherwise I wouldn't use rib. If you have an, a, a, small, a simple secondary case, then maybe they didn't mess around with the tip, then maybe I would find it. But in most of these complex secondary cases, the tip has been messed up with, there's a lot of scar, there's been bleeding, and I will thin it under direct vision without undue concern. Maybe this comes from some experience. I think it comes from a good light and a good magnification. And I am thinning that tip until I almost see the dermis. I don't see the dermis, all right. I see just, just I stopped before. But I am not concerned, and I tell you it's not a big issue usually. So I will thin it quite extensively. At that point, I will not use pitangis. I will use a little portion of scar as a little rope to reconstruct my supratip break. 